evening. Good to see each of you here this evening, brothers and sisters. Always good to see those who are able to come again, to return, as uh, we have another opportunity to worship the Lord, as we have another opportunity to study His Word. And it is a uh, wonderful blessing that we are able to come here, and, and it is good to see each of you here this, this evening. I would ask you to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, as we humbly bow before you in prayer, we praise and exalt you. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Father, watch over us and help us to be faithful and true to you, Father. Father, we pray that we may encourage one another, that we may strengthen one another, that we may admonish one another. Father, we pray that we may help one another get to heaven. We pray that we'll be diligent in our study of your word. We are so thankful for your word that teaches us the way that we should go, Father. We pray that we'll be faithful to what your word teaches us. Live as you would have us to live. We may share the good news with others, that they may come to know you, Father. Father, we pray that we may be strengthened and, and do what is right in your sight, Father. It is in Christ's most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. This morning, brothers and sisters, you were here. You will remember, hopefully, that we spoke about a praying for an increase. We, we spoke about, of course, the need for doing so. Prayer, as we noticed, is of great importance. It is something that is taught throughout the Bible. We talked a little bit, touched on the fact that it was uh, has been discussed. It, we see it first brought up in, in Genesis 4 and verse 26. And, and then throughout the Bible we see time and again either instruction to pray, instruction how to pray, um, instructions on what to pray. We see examples of those who did pray. And the Bible teaches us these many things about prayer. And though this morning we talked about that, it wasn't per se on prayer. Tonight's lesson, an evening prayer, likewise is not exactly on prayer itself, but is touching on the subject. And we are not going to talk this evening about the, the things we talked about this morning exactly, so we will not be doing this morning's lesson again. But we are going to talk about the importance of, of continuing to pray and, and looking at, indeed, the evening prayer. I came across, and, and I suppose this is where I had, had found this, uh, and, and thinking back, I don't really recall where I had come up with this, come across this, but I had come across this song by uh, Maud Battersby. I have no idea who that is or, or anything, but uh, it is a song entitled Evening Prayer. And I'll just read you the words to it. If I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused one foot to go astray, if I have walked in my own willful way, dear Lord, forgive. If I have uttered idle words or vain, if I have turned aside from want or pain, lest I offend some other through the strain, dear Lord, forgive. If I have been perverse or hard or cold, if I have longed for shelter in the fold, when thou hast forgiven me for um, forgiven me some fort, excuse me, when thou hast given me some fort to hold, dear Lord, forgive. Forgive the sins I have confessed to thee, forgive the secret sins I do not see. O oh, guide me, love me, and my keeper be. Amen. And we think about that, brothers and sisters. You've heard me talk about how that we should never, and, and I, I think this is a song or a poem or something as well, that we should never get out of our bed. Do we get out of our bed without praying? I think it's a song in the songbook, as a matter of fact, that, that we have. Um, you know, that did, we, did we leave without, uh, without praying? We often think about various times when we are to pray. We think about various prayers that we, we, we do pray. We, we pray what? Before we eat. We 
should pray before we eat, give thanks for the food that we have uh, been blessed with. We give thanks perhaps uh, when we have been on a journey. Maybe we are praying for a safe trip and we get there and we, we, we pray and we say thank you for helping us, for allowing us to, to make it safely. We get ready to go to work or, or we get ready to go do something and we say a prayer and we pray. Brothers and sisters, we should pray when we get ready to settle our heads down to prayer or to, to sleep. We think, uh, uh, many of us, uh, though it's been a number of years, will likely remember as children being taught to pray. And I know not everyone uses these, but you might remember, of course, there were two prayers I learned as a child, of course, uh, thinking about the food, but also whenever we are getting ready for bed. You're smiling too. I'm sure you know where I'm headed with this. Now I lay me down to sleep, right? We remember that prayer, I'm sure, and we've probably prayed that at one time or another. And though we are all past the point where we would necessarily use that prayer as a child, would you, as a small child would, it is an easy prayer to remember. And, and I'm not saying it is the best avenue or, or say, criticizing it. It is what it is, and, and it is uh, useful for what it is useful for. Brothers and sisters, I want us to consider some things and in doing so recognize the importance of praying as we do lay our heads down at night to rest. Consider, for example, the consequences of sin. We stop and think and, and we know and, and I, I trust we all, each of us knows about the Bible and what it teaches about sin. We think of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is, in essence, doing that which God said don't do. James, in James 4 and verse 17, teaches us that it is also failing to do that which we know we ought to be doing. When, when God tells us we ought to do something, when He tells us, in fact, to do something, and we do not do it, when we know that we are to do what he has said, what is good and right and righteous, we know that we have sin. And there are other texts we know that teaches us about that. 1 John chapter 5 and verse, 7, verse 17 teaches us about sin as well. And, and, and so we see in a number of texts about sin and, and what it in fact is in in Romans chapter 14 and verse 23, further Paul teaches us about sin and what it is. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we, we look at these texts and we understand that, that it is, that sin is described, but it likewise tells us about the consequences of sin. Sin obviously separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and two Isaiah there in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 tells us that sin that our sin and notice it says it doesn't say our parents sin it doesn't say someone else's sin it doesn't say our buddy's sin it says our sin our sin separates us from God behold the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated between you and, and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you, that He will not hear. So if we are separated from God, if He is not hearing us, if He is not re responding to us, brothers and sisters, friends, we need to understand that perhaps our sin has separated us from, separated us from God. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying I pray for something. He says no to my, to my request, and therefore I must be in sin because he didn't give me what I wanted. I used this morning the example of, of the Mercedes Benz. I don't know what car you necessarily like. I call the, the they fix the Mercedes Benz. I've actually been in one, and they, they make it where, where poor or stupid people can't figure it out and steal it because... Because I'm telling you, I had to go let up my boss's car window one time, and I, being the poor, stupid person that I was, I, I couldn't even figure out how to, 
crank the car up to, to work it. The key is different than what you would what our keys are. But but maybe you pray, not to get off here, but maybe you pray for for a Mercedes Benz. He says no. Again, that doesn't mean I've sinned, it just means he said no. It's like when we have children and our children want something and we say no. How often is it? What did I do? Why won't you let me have what I want? You know, it's always a, a reply to, you know, and, and maybe the child thinks, did I do something wrong that I'm, no. The answer is just no. You can't have that at this point. It's not good for you or, or you don't need it or, or whatever the, the case may be. But, but brothers and sisters, understand clearly that our sin, as we see here in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, does separate us from God. We see further, and, and perhaps even stronger, Paul teaches us that, that our sin causes us to die. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we are told that the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We often look at Ezekiel chapter 18 and, and verse 20 in relation to the fact that we are not guilty, we are not held responsible for the sins of others. But I want you to notice something there in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Again, we see there what Paul is, is speaking of. When Paul says the wages of sin is death, he's, he's taking play out of, out of what Ezekiel said, isn't he? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So we see the, the, the consequences of sin, and when we consider the consequences of sin, and then we consider the brevity of life. James chapter 4. Beginning with verse 13, James, James spells out, lays out, how brief life is. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue their year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time. And then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Brothers and sisters, too many people have spent the, what time they have making big plans about the future, only to be surprised that they don't reach that point. I saw, uh, of course, it's not hard on the media uh, to, to notice on the media where they were talking about the, their favorite subject of late, the coronavirus, and, and they were talking, and then the New Jersey governor was, was talking about this situation there, and he happened to identify and, and recognize a lady, and perhaps from, from the look of some of your, your faces, maybe you saw this, this lady that turned 108 the other day, 108. She was seven years old whenever the Spanish flu, as they called it, the pandemic in 1918, when this flu went through. So she survived that. I don't know if she, they didn't identify that she had it at that time, but she obviously came through it without dying. But she also, at 108, caught the coronavirus and got over it. 108 years old. We stop and think, and, and maybe it crosses your mind at 108 years old, how long this woman has lived. 108 years. And the things she has seen. Brothers and sisters, she was born, and I don't know when her birthday is and, and all, but she was born the year the Titanic sank. Think about that. At least I think, depending on when her birthday is. I suppose if her birthday was was later in the year as possible or, or depending on uh, 
when her birthday is. Maybe she was born the year before or something. But she was she was born around the time the Titanic Titanic sank. That's a long time ago. And I was talking to Olivia about her age and and. And, and the age of people and how long some of them live. And when you live to that point, and the odds are, I, I mentioned here recently about my aunt who, who turned 91. This lady is actually old enough to be my aunt's mother at 108. And my aunt being 91. The chances are she may, if she had children, that her children may all be dead. And consider that she can have grandchildren that are older than some of us in here. And yet, brothers and sisters, life is brief. 108 years. And it's a drop in the bucket, isn't it? We, we go back and we study the various ones in, in the Old Testament who lived hundreds of years, much older than this lady or, or others uh, like her. And yet their lives passed by in, I'm sure, the blink of an eye. I've said on a number of occasions that the older I get, the faster it seems to go. I realize time is constant and it's not going a bit faster for me, but it just seems like it. But it does seem like it's going faster. Brothers and sisters, when we consider these two points, when we consider that, that, that sin separates us from God, and we consider the brevity of life, and then we consider the results of passing from this life into the next, unprepared to meet our God, brothers and sisters, we better make certain that we are right with God. We, we consider the such text as Matthew 25, where, where Jesus teaches us about uh, making certain that we are right with God, teaches us about heaven and hell. There in verse 46, of Matthew 25, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Brothers and sisters, he, he, he teaches us about the terribleness, suffering that is there. Verse 30 in this same chapter, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what is he getting at when he lays out there in the parable of the talents and he says, cast the unprofitable servant out, cast him into outer darkness. What do you think he's talking about? What are, don't we understand he's talking about casting those who are lost into eternal damnation, into hell? Described here as outer darkness. Suffering brothers and sisters, suffering that is eternal. Consider these things. And so we, we understand all of this. Hopefully we understand these things. And, and it ought to make us recognize the need to make certain that we are right in the sight of God. That we are, are not putting off anything. That we are not allowing ourselves to be uh, continue to be separated from God, continue to be spiritually dead, but that we are solving the problem right now. I want you to consider a couple of other texts in relation to this. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 5 and beginning with verse 23. Here in, on the sermon, the sermon on the Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about, in, in Matthew chapter 5 and beginning with verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, here, uh, a gift to the altar, a gift for God, uh, praising God, perhaps even uh, coming and, and, and sacrificing a, a, a sacrifice, but it seems to be maybe more than the uh, for seeking forgiveness, but in fact offering a gift to God. If, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, go ahead and sacrifice, right? Not what he says. Notice in verse 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Brothers and sisters, we see there the immediacy 
uh, the need to, to resolve this immediately. Because certainly, we ought to recognize the need to offer a gift for God. To give Him a gift. To sacrifice to God. We know we are, are told to offer the fruit of our lips, right? So when we see these things, we ought to know that this is important to offer this. He is offering, the, the person is offering a gift to God. What could be more important than offering something to God? Sacrificing to God? Giving to Him? Well, in the in context here, he's saying not that he's taking away from the, the importance of sacrificing to God. Certainly God lays out throughout the Bible the need to give to God, the need to, to offer. Again, we offer the fruit of our lips in, in praising Him. But certainly he lays out the need to, to do so. But here he puts up the idea, the importance of making certain we are right with our brother. We leave our gift there and we go fix the problem that, that we have with our brother. We make certain that we are reconciled with our brothers. With our brother. This is crucial. It is needful uh, to, to take care of right at that, at that point. And, and we need to make certain that we are doing so in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 26. Paul here writing in Ephesians 4 and verse 26 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun do go down upon your wrath. Brothers and sisters, again, don't allow sin to hang around. Don't allow sin to, to be there too many times. And, and you've heard me, if you've been here very long, you've heard me whenever I've offered invitations, and I'm sure... Others have done so as well. Uh, you've, you've heard that, that point where you offer the invitation, where the invitation is, is given to, to respond. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to, to, to repent of some sin, to respond and not to put it off. Too many people say, I'll take care of it next week. I'll take care of it someday when I have a more convenient time. Sound familiar? more convenient season. It should sound familiar, brothers and sisters. Isn't that what I think Felix said? Or Festus, one of the two. I always get the two mixed up. But we, we see, brothers and sisters, that, that, that too many get their minds into thinking, I've got time. I'll put it off. I'll take care of it someday. Someday it never comes. Someday it never comes because, well, because death comes first. Because our hearts are seared to the point where our sin no, matter, no, no longer bothers us. Where all kinds of reasoning comes to mind. And, and we allow ourselves, brothers and sisters, to pass from this life unprepared to meet God. And brothers and sisters, it is with that in mind that we, we think about this evening prayer. And, and, and the thing that we read here again with this uh, Maud Battersby, if I'm pronouncing it, her name, I think it would be a her, uh, correctly. You know, the, the idea of repenting before God, before we settle our heads down to rest. That we make certain that we handle that problem right then. And of course, keep in mind, we, we think about this, and it doesn't mean that I have to wait till I lie down to go to, go, to, go to sleep before I say such a prayer, before I correct such a thing. In fact, Paul again there in Ephesians 4 and verse 26 said, Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it, don't put it off, but deal with it right then. And, and when you settle down tonight, brothers and sisters, if you have some sin in your life, make certain that if you have not already dealt with it, that you do. That you deal with it right then, because too many people again 
decide, I don't have time. I'll put it off. I'll deal with it another time. It's just too, I'm too busy right now. I'll deal with it some other time. Brothers and sisters, we should never be so busy, no matter what we do. And that's not to say life doesn't have its important matters to handle. We know we have various important points to, uh, uh, of life to handle. We have our family to provide for and take care of, to be there for. We have our jobs that we do. We have friends that we have to help sometimes. We have, we have many things that come up. But brothers and sisters, we never have anything that comes up that is more important than our relationship with God. Dealing with those things. Tonight, if you are here, if you have allowed some sin to separate you from God, then I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, that you correct that. If you're a Christian and you stumble and you, you fall, He promises that we're faithful to confess our faults. He's faithful to forgive us. Or if you're here, you're not even a Christian. You haven't even taken that step, we might say. You haven't done what you need to do. You have not corrected uh, that. Then, brothers and sisters, to make certain <clears throat> that you, you do what you need to do. The Bible tells us what we need to do. We must hear the Word of God. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of our sins. Confess Him to be the Son of God and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of one's sins. You're here having need. We encourage you, please, to come while we stand and while we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today.